What's up, everybody? Uh, what's up, everybody? Uh, this is chapter three of Norm, uh, Norman Levine's *The Tragic Deception*. Marks contra angles. It's titled *Toward a Philosophical Anthropology*. Marx's relation to Hegel was an ambiguous relation. On the one hand, Marx accepted the Hegelian notion of the dialectic of negativity. Stripped of its idealist trap, excuse me, idealist wrapping, the idea of negation was placed in a worldly setting by Marx given material form made into a social class, the proletariat, which had as the proletariat's historical duty, the negation and overthrow of capitalism. On the other hand, the Hegelian philosophy of culture was categorically rejected by Marx in negating Hegel's conception of na culture. Marx's intent in the critique of Hegel's dialectic and general philosophy, Marx formulated his own philosophy of culture as well as com of communism. Marx Marxism has too often been thought of as a strategy for social revolution, as an economic system dedicated to the nationalization of property, and not often enough as a philosophical anthropology. One of the major weaknesses of Marxism, it has been argued, was that it attempted no description of basic human nature. Without an analysis of the human essence, the argument concluded it was impossible to correctly portray how the good society should be constructed. Marx, however, did indicate that he thought the human essence to be. Marx did speculate on anthropology and from these speculations argued that communism was the form of society best suited to correspond to the human essence. Communism was an anthropocentric society. The attempt, therefore, to arrive at the major features of Marx's philosophical anthropology, to sketch the outline of his philosophy of culture, not only will take us into the heart of Marxism, but will illustrate most clearly how Marx envisioned a communist society. Marx's philosophy of culture derived from four ideas. These ideas were one, objectification, two, alienation, three, reappropriation, four, self-affirmation. Section one, objectification. Self-consciousness for Hegel was a kind of force. Self-consciousness was compelled to express self-consciousness as self, to manifest self-consciousness as self. Self-consciousness had to objectify self-consciousness as self in the natural entities that surrounded self-consciousness and to mold and shape these entities in accordance with self-consciousness's own laws. Objectification meant the outpouring, the release of consciousness as a modifying and reconstructing energy into the human and physical environment. For Hegel, however, objectification was purely a spiritual process. It was mind that was the modifying instrumentality. It was mind that sculptured things, fashioned ideas, created institutions. For Hegel, man was the self-creation of consciousness and history of the museum of man's myriad temporal transformations. Man could recognize the world, know the world to be, in fact, his world, because he was aware of the labor, had, had knowledge of the activity of his own consciousness. Knowledge, i.e., world, was self-knowledge. In order to understand Marx's approach to the problem of objectification and his deviation from the Hegelian format, it is first necessary to analyze what Marx meant by the objective. What was objective to Marx was human species being. Man had needs and abilities, felt hunger and pain, was passionate and sensuous. The sharing of these qualities by all of mankind was for Marx human species being or human essence. The objective in Marxian philosophy was the naturalistic component of species life. Self-consciousness did not play a part in this Marxian definition of objectification. Instead of a rational process, Marx was conceived of a material physical interchange between man and nature. Objectification for Marx meant the expression, the manifestation of human needs and abilities in the material world. Because of his essence, man had to labor. Because of his essence, man had to actively modify the physical world to satisfy his own needs. Objectification for Marx meant the outpouring, the release of human abilities compelled by human need in order to so modify the physical as to guarantee his continued continued existence. The process of history for Marx can thus be described as the humanization of nature. Nature was not given a human form, a human visage. Rather, nature was so shaped, so altered, that it would accommodate itself to human needs. Nature was humanized because human labor forced it to affirm and support species life. For Marx, as for Hegel, man created himself, but whereas the Hegel human self-creation was, whereas the Hegel For Marx, as for Hegel, I don't know if I'm reading this correctly, but or if it's a typo, but for Marx, as for Hegel, man created himself. But whereas Hegel, human self, -crea whereas the Hegel human self creation was the labor of self consciousness, for Marx, human self creation was the labor of the naturalistic forces of the species. History was not in the Marxian scheme the expression of universal spirit. Man made man's socioeconomic environment. And this socioeconomic environment was a productive environment, which in turn determined the and the conditioned man's idea 
thoughts, and values determine the Creator Himself. Section 2. Alienation. The objective for Hegel in contradistinction to Marx was always outside of man. Self-consciousness must always objectify self-consciousness itself. To be known, to be experienced, self-consciousness must be observed, must be seen. Self-consciousness can only be observed in the thing that self-consciousness fashioned, which is now external and separate from the object. To be objective for Hegel meant that a subject must be able to contemplate its conscious activity, and this activity could only be contemplated in things external to the subject. Alienation for Hegel was thus an existential necessity. As soon as self-consciousness fashioned a theory and idea, it was alienated from the subject by way of the objective. Alienation was the process by which consciousness, forced by consciousness's own nature to objectify consciousness's self, and fulfilling consciousness's destiny in a thing, finds that consciousness is no longer finds that the thing is no longer part of the subject. Finds that, I don't know, finds that it is no longer part of a subject, the subject. Hegel's philosophy of culture, therefore, was a philosophy of alienation. Man lived in a cultural universe of man's own making, but a universe that was estranged from him. Hegel did not understand alienation in a totally negative sense. Because of alienation, man had his cultural heritage. Because of alienation, man made his history. Because of alienation, man came to understand his own powers, the magnificent energies of consciousness, man's self. Since man could observe these energies in the objects and cultural forms with which man surrounded himself, estrangement was the inevitable result of consciousness obeying consciousness's own necessity of objectification. It was both the power of mind and the fatality of mind. In the Hegelian universe, man must always lose himself in order to find himself. Some people, some power, some force was always taken from man, lost, stolen, or surrendered. There was a tragic component to Hegel's philosophy. Man was doomed to be forever estranged in a world of his own creation. Hegel spoke of a divine discontent, of a discontent that was an essential mode of existence because alienation was an essential mode of self-consciousness. Tragic existence was Hegel's theme. The glorification of human power, self-consciousness, in its activity was at the same instant the coming into being of estrangement, heroic anxiety. In the Marxian universe, alienation had a totally different meaning. Rather than being a necessity, alienation was a social condition. Rather than being a destiny of self-consciousness, alienation was an environmental cancer produced by living men in their living conscious activity. The expropriation of human labor, which is their life's activity, was alienation. Men spent their life's activity to sustain the species. The expenditure of their life's activity, in essence, their life should be fully returned to them in the products and objects thereby molded. If this were not the case, if some other person or institution expropriated this life activity for his or its personal advantage, the exploited man was an alienated man. Marx did not share Hegel's tragic discontent. Since alienation was not a fate but a social condition to be cured, Marx dedicated himself to the overcoming of alienation. Communism was such a supersession. There was more optimism in Marx than in Hegel. The future for Marx could witness the beginning of a true human history. There was hope in Marx and openness to the future. There was a project. Human rationality, understanding the class nature of past history, comprehending the condition that produced alienation, could conceive a project of revolution that would begin the age of humanized history. Rationality was a guide to action because the construction of a de-alienated existence was fully consonant with species power. 3. Reappropriation. In the history of self-consciousness for Hegel, alienation must be succeeded or reappropriated. The thing that had been lost must be regained or consciousness as a force sought to repossess its own creation. Alienation must be superseded because consciousness or desire hungrily reached out to reoccupy the world it made and temporarily it surrendered. For Hegel, however, reappropriation takes place totally in self-consciousness. The thing was repossessed rationally. The thing was sensuous, not sensuously felt. Self-consciousness made a tool which was then alienated. Self-consciousness reappropriated the tool when it superseded it and when it could make a greater tool a machine. Reappropriation of, for Hegel involved negation, the canceling of a prior moment of creation in order to observe that, absorb that moment in a continuing creation. Negation for Hegel meant transcendence. Marx also, like Hegel, referred to reappropriation as a taking back into oneself. The objects that species actively fashioned, excuse me, the objects that species activity fashioned must return to the species in an immediate, direct, sensual manner.
Quote, the objects of his drives exist outside him as objects independent of him, yet they are objects of his needs, essential objects which are indispensable to the exercise and confirmation of his faculties. The fact that man is an embodied, living, real, sentient, objective being with natural powers means that he has real sensuous objects as the objects of his being, or that he can only express his being in real sensuous objects. To be objective, natural, sentient, and at the same time to have object, nature, and sense outside oneself, or to be oneself, object nature and sense for a third person is the same thing end quote Marx what was made by the objective activity of the species if not alienated from it was also objective if species labor produced food the food was objective and related immediately to the objective hunger of the species therefore in an unalienated society there was an immediate reciprocity between the object made and the need the object was meant to gratify the need could not be gratified unless the object were made and thus objective need and object coexist and mutually complement each other reappropriation for marx was thus defined as mutual complementation it was predicated on the interdependence of man and modified nature, the harmony, balance, the sensuously pleasurable reciprocity of objective need and object. In this sense, the world for Marx should be a world of enjoyment, for if modified nature completed complemented need, then labor would produce its own immediate and direct pleasure. Marx is referring here to the naturalistic interconnection between man and nature, where man and nature were two modes of the same process, where the activity of one had immediately returned to it confirmation of that activity by the other. 4. Self-affirmation. Self-affirmation for Hegel was a process that took place in self-consciousness. Self-affirmation was that moment when self-consciousness was most like self-consciousness itself. Therefore, self-affirmation was the moment of negation. Self-consciousness was most like itself when in the activity of transcendence. The Marxian definition of self-affirmation had two forms, integration and joy. Through the production of the objective, individual man was integrated into the species. Because man's production was directly social production, man produced for the entire species and himself simultaneously. Therefore, in the act of production, man reaffirms species being in its twin modality, in its objective expression in the individual, and in its universal form throughout mankind. Because species activity was feeling sensuous activity, the confirmation of that activity was joyful. When a man made paint and it confirmed the sense of sight, when a man made music and it confirmed the sense of hearing, he was the recipient of joy. Communist society was to reclaim the world for man, that is the reappropriation of human objectification, was at the same time reappropriation of the human essence. The humanism of Marx in a modulated, economized form was also a dominant factor in the Grundrisse and capital. Indeed, the crucial notion of species being was transported from the Paris manuscripts to the Grundrisse. In that later work, commenting upon how the economic process should enhance the internet connectedness between man and man, Marx asserted that, quote, this prov proves that each of them reaches beyond his own particular need, etc., as a human being, and that they relate to one another as human beings, that their common that their common species being Gattungswesen is acknowledged, end quote, Marx. Further on in the same work, when discussing the evolution of man from his tribal to his communal existence, Marx wrote that, quote, human beings become individuals only through the process of history. He appears originally as a species being, Gattungswesen, excuse me, Gattungswesen, clan being her an animal, although in no way whatever as a polis, polis creature in the political sense, end quote. Thus, in the more mature marks, the notion of a common human essence was still present. This anthropological core, however, was understood by the economized marks as need, as physical and psychological want, as the requirement of human self-sustenance and well-being. In addition, Marx still conceived of history as the autogenesis of man. Anthropological essence remained, but it received different forms, different modalities, was a historical product as it moved in history through various economic and productive structures. Nevertheless, as the latter as the, me, as the later Marx speculated upon the social and economic requirements of human life, it became apparent to Marx that the overriding concern was the production and reproduction of subsistence. Quote, <clears throat> 
The aim of all these communities is survival, i.e. Produ reproduction of the individuals who compose it as proprietors, dot, dot, dot. The production, however, is of the same time necessarily new production, destruction of the old form, end quote. In the Grundrisse and capital, the central concern of Marx is the production and, re and consumption of the necessities of life. The ideas of objectification, alienation, reappropriation, and self-affirmation were also present in these later works, but they were realized within them. They appeared from the perspective of socioeconomic contingency. In the Marx who was concerned with the production and reproduction of life in society, objectification appeared in the form of economic labor. Quote, all production is an objectification, fair gegen stand Lichung of the individual, end quote. but this production could only correspond to the inherent talent and skills of the individual. Nature was dumb and mute, offering itself passively to the active agent man, and what was made satisfied a uh, human need. But what was made the modification of nature could only be expressive of human abilities, quote, for the use value which he offers exists only as an ability, a capacity, Fermogen, of his bodily existence has no existence apart from that, end quote. Marx. In order to labor, man must appropriate. What he appropriated was the materiality provided to him by nature, a vast laboratory, a storehouse of mutable objects. Nature offered to man the physics upon which human powers of modification could operate. After appropriation, man must consume. The economized Marx did not talk of self-affirmation, but consumption. Human life and society were perpetuated through consumption. The human essence was not reaffirmed by consumption. Rather, consumption reproduced individual and societal survival. The theme of alienation was prevalent throughout the later writings of Marx. The whole structure of Das Kapital recounted the destiny of human labor as it was expropriated by the greed of the capitalist. Society under capitalism was alienated society par excellence because the wealth in the hands of the propertied classes was essentially the stolen labor of the masses. Part 3 of Volume 1 of Capital was devoted to a discussion of the working day. Of course, Marx value was... For Marx, value is created by labor. Under this formula, the working day assumed critical importance because any extension of that working day, by whatever means, equaled more labor time and therefore more value. In these pages, Marx described how the capitalist attempted to increase the productivity of the working day by the use of machinery, of women, of children, by the enlargement of the population in order to increase its profits. The length of the working day was not simply an economic problem, not merely a matter of time. Rather, it was a matter of life. By increasing that day, the capitalist, in fact, stole from the worker the time he had for his own life. The worker was then victimized, dehumanized, and the time he could expend on himself for his own enjoyments and development grew smaller and smaller. Furthermore, Part 4 of Volume 1 of Capital was devoted to a discussion of machinery. According to Marx, machinery was the, ver the best way to enlarge the working day. Machinery enlarged the working day in two ways. Machinery improved the productivity of the labor, and because of the better means for production and transportation, it quickened the rate of circulation. Value could be fa produced faster, a profit could be realized faster, and thus the circuit for the production of capital intensified and multiplied. Consequently, the introduction of machinery, factories, industrial plants was one of the major quests of capitalism. But the factory destroyed the bonds of human interconnectedness. The communal village, the familial farm, passed into the wastebasket of history. In their place stepped the atomized, the barbarized, excuse me, the, yeah, the barbarized factory worker. The industrial worker was thus not only alienated from his fellow worker, but also from himself. Working in unsanitary conditions, he himself was reduced to a machine. His labor was monotonous, dull, and his movements simply replicated in mindless fashion the mechanical movement of technology. Alienation in capital is not primarily alienation from man's species being. Alienation in capital is not primarily anthropological. Alienation in capital was fundamentally socioeconomic. Human labor made its world, and within that world, man was alone, dehumanized, a victim of his own creation. In a world made by the self, man was estranged. Such were the principles of Marx's philosophical anthropology. They were derived from fundamental presuppositions regarding the nature of man. But the principles of Marx's philosophical anthropology were not, are not merely guidelines, mere direction. They are sources from which a radical criticism of past and existing societies can be unleashed. It is not enough to attack societies because societies restrain and hinder productive forces because they curtail economic abundance. No criticism of any society from the Marxian perspective can be complete unless it is shown how that society deviates from the principles of communist philosophical anthropology. In short... The human essence, as conceived by Marx, must always be the final criterion in judging the positive or negative features of any socioeconomic formation. 
Marx's definition of communism conformed to his anthropocentric view of society. That is, in a communist society, it was, quote, impossible that anything should exist independently of individuals, end quote. Marx's attack on bourgeois economic apologists like Smith, Ricardo, and Proudhon began from this basis, the basis that these men treated economic categories as eternal. Exchange, money, labor were seen by bourgeois economic theoreticians as adamantine categories that were present and operative in all societies at all times. In fact, determining these societies by their unchanging laws, Marx is opposed to this categorization of economic formulas because they were there independent of man, existing above man, beyond human control in reality, determining the manner in which human beings necessarily must function. Marx's theories of surplus value is an attack on just such an external eternalization of economic categories. To begin discussing economics on the basis of exchange was at once to alienate man because we immediately debated a mechanical process, a law of natural objects rather than human activity. To begin discussing economics from the point of view of money was immediately to, de to dehumanize man because the point of discussion became the dumb, mute object money, a thing in itself without any human relationships rather than the power of human beings to modify their environment. Thinking of economic categories as immutable for Marx was simply another form of Hegelianism, that is, of idealism. If things were made immutable, they came, became, in essence, like the world spirit, veritable God, sovereign, unchanging, all-powerful. What Marx wished to do was to historicize economics. Communism for Marx was, quote, the production of the form of intercourse itself, end quote. Communism did not begin with technology, productive capacity, or systems analysis. Communism began by creating the forms of social intercourse through which man could have immediately accessibility to the conditions of labor. Communism meant that man must be free to objectify himself, to reappropriate his activity, and to have his faculties reaffirmed. Communism, therefore, referred to those social relationships that would allow for objectification, reappropriation, and self effort information. Marx's future society was not things. It was the self-activity of man. Proletarian society was not objects. Proletarian society was the, quote, development of the forces of the individuals themselves, end quote. Proletarian society was an anthropocentric society, a mode of socio-productive existence in which man continually confirmed his essence because the natural and human environment was freely accessible to him and consequently fashioned in his image. It was a means of being humanly authenticated. Communism was not static. Communism was the final eschatological... Excuse me. Communism was not the final eschatological society. Communism was not a given form. Communism was that society in which human productive forces will be at their fullest. Communism will therefore change. It will have a history. In a communist form of society, relationships of human authenticity, the objective made confirming objective human essence, would be conquered. What would change were the productive forces, the tools by which to fashion nature. If the productive forces changed, then the social relationships built on these productive forces would also have to change. Communist society was also historical society. Presumably, however, as the relations of production change of necessity, they would simply re-express the central communist thesis, authenticate the human essence. That is, it was entirely conceivable, in fact necessary, to have endless forms of human social intercourse, as long as these forms of intercourse embodied the principle that the object made must affirm the objective human essence. Therefore, the form of relationship would change, but communist philosophical anthropology would always be the intent behind these relationships. As late as 1858 to 1859, Marx continued to define communism as an anthropocentric society. A quotation from the Grundrisse is in order. Quote, in fact, however, when the limited bourgeois form is stripped away, what is wealth other than the universality of individual needs, capacities, pleasures, productive forces, etc., created through universal exchange? The full development of human mastery over the forces of nature, those of so-called nature as well as of humanity's own nature, the absolute working out of his creative potentialities with no presupposition other than the previous historic development which makes this totality of development, i.e. the development of all human powers as such, the end in itself, not as measured on a predetermined yardstick where he does not reproduce himself in one specificity but produces his totality, strives not to remain something he has become but is in the absolute movement of becoming, end quote. Marx, Grundrisse. From the Paris manuscripts until the Grundrisse, Marx's definition of communism remains substantially the same. In the economized Marx, a certain level of industrial productive capacity was a precondition. 
In the economized Marx, there was less emphasis on the human essence, but there remained the central idea of the release of human capacities. There remained the central idea that society must conform to and to be supportive of the content of human life. Man would not be a trunk would be not a truncated being, but a total being, because of the productive proficiency of communism, because of the increased disposable time. This productivity would leave in the hands of individuals. Man would be free to enlarge all his productive powers and his expressive abilities. Quote, For the real wealth is the developed productive power of all individuals. End quote. In the later Marx, also, communism was eudaimonistic. Happiness for Marx meant the freedom to be a total person, that is, the freedom to indulge all of our productive power and expressive capacities. Culture could not be separated from the realization of human abilities. The fully developed individual was the presupposition of culture. Civilization was that level of society, that degree of socioeconomic advancement, which offered the requisite condition for the attainment of culture, the coming into being of the wealth of human power. The preceding analysis has concerned itself with the broad principles of Marx's philosophical anthropology. Ideas like objectification, alienation, reappropriation, and self-affirmation were discussed and shown to be indispensable to Marx's definition of the human essence. Other statements of Marx were more empirical, that is, they discussed the naturalistic basis for his philosophical anthropology. In short, Marx affirmed that the biological nature of the species substantiated the philosophical principles of his anthropology. In The Holy Family, Marx just opposed a series of statements from Holbach, Holbach being a uh, 18th century uh, French materialist. Um, quote, Man can only love himself and the objects he loves. He can have affection only for himself and the other beings of his kind. Man can never separate himself from himself for a single instant in his life. He cannot lose sight of himself. It is always our convenience, our interest that makes us hate or love things, dot, dot, dot. But, quote, it is his own interest, in his own interest, man must love other men because they are necessary to his welfare, dot, dot, dot. Moral proves to him that all beings, moral proves to him that of all beings, the most necessary to man is man, end quote. End quote. I'm not sure if, I guess that's a Holbach quote uh, by Marx, from Marx, within a quote from Marx. From the Holy Family. In the above paragraph, Marx affirmed that the basic nature of man was emotional sensate. Man was a thing of passion. Man felt pain and passion as well as happiness and love. Man had naturalistic needs and naturalistic abilities. Rationality also inherently belonged to the species. But the sensate nature of man was the actual condition of his sociability. Because man had needs, he had need for other people. Because man felt passion and happiness, he needed to associate himself with other people. Human sociability, human species existence, was merely the expression of the sensate character of existence. Marx is aware of human self-interest, human selfishness. Marx was not Rousseau. Marx did not believe that humans basically were good. Self-interest was also a feature of species sensate existence. But self-interest could also serve as the basis of human integration, was itself the ground of the need for human relationships. Quote, if correctly understood, interest is the principle of all morality. Man's private interest must be made to coincide with the interest of humanity, end quote. Human rationality must devise means to that private interest so that private interest can be generalized into in universal interest. In Marx's analysis of human sensate nature, he was traveling along a path similar to that of the moral philosophers Thomas Hutchinson, Hutchinson and Adam Smith. In the 18th century, these men were attempting to make men's passionate nature serve as the basis of morality in society. The philosophy of emotion and empathy was replacing religious morality as the ground of brotherliness. Drawing upon English philosophy, which Marx designated as leading directly to socialism and communism, Marx felt he had found in the sensuous substrate of species existence the naturalistic foundation of social cooperativeness. This sensuous substrate was also a naturalistic verification of Marx's concept of reaffirmation. Human sensate nature was by its very essence interpersonal because of its inherent need of the other. Sensate nature was by its very essence 
human interdependent humanly interdependent because of its quest for the other this dependence upon the other this fulfillment through the other was what marx had in mind when he talked of human and species self-affirmation it should be clear from the above discussion that for marx human sensate nature was society itself social life did not derive from the passionate nature of man rather social life had to be the passionate nature of man such a definition led marx directly to his philosophy of enjoyment and another quotation this time from the german ideology is necessary quote in the Middle Ages, the pleasures were strictly classified. Each state had its own distinct forms of pleasure and its distinct manner of enjoying those pleasures. The nobility was the estate privileged to devote itself exclusively to pleasure, while the separation of work and enjoyment already existed for the bourgeoisie, and pleasure was subordinated to work. Dot, dot, dot. The present crude form of proletarian pleasure is due, on the one hand, to the long working hours, which led to the utmost intensification of the need for recreation, and on the other hand, to the restriction both qualitative and quantitative of the means of pleasure accessible to the proletarian. In general, the enjoyment of all hitherto existing estates and classes had to be utter childish, exhausting, or crude, because it was always completely divorced from the vital activity, the content of the life of individuals, the more or less reduced to imparting an illusory content to a meaningless society. The hitherto existing forms of enjoyment could, of course, only be criticized when the contradiction between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat had developed to such an extent that the existing mode of production and intercourse could be criticized as well. End quote. Marx, the German ideology. In the above paragraph, Marx described the separation of species activity, work, and pleasure. In the Middle Ages, pleasure was thought to be a prerogative of the aristocracy. In the age of the bourgeoisie, pleasure was subordinated to material acquisition, financial greed. A slave in the period of capitalism, the proletarian, had little time for pleasure, and what little pleasure he had was debasing and degrading. The separation of praxis from the self-gratification of the results of that praxis to forced man from his own nature, from, for his own activity was never a source of pleasure to him. Marx was not talking about hedonism. Marx was not saying that the end of life was the maximization of sensual excitement. Marx was a cyberite. I don't know the hell that means. I mean, Marx was not a cyberite. S Y B A R I T E. For Marx, the normal state of species existence was activity. The essence of man was pra his praxis. Objectification and reappropriation are aspects of his inherent praxis. Marx was saying that human activity in itself should be pleasurable. Praxis itself was enjoyment. The end of life for Marx was human well-being based upon the naturalistic substrate of the species. Social life must correspond to the needs of species praxis. The forms of social intercourse and social relatedness must be species activity. Thus, at the very core of Marx's philosophical anthropology was the principle of eudaimonism. The good life was a life in which man was in harmony with his needs and abilities. Marx's philosophy of enjoyment, his definition of happiness, his life in accordance with nature, also served as the basis for his definition of virtue. In The Holy Family, man attacked Eugene Sue's novel, uh, Fleur de Marie. Quote, Good and evil in Marie's mind are not the moral abstractions of good and evil. She is good because she has never ceased suffering to anybody. She has always been human towards her inhuman surroundings. She is good because the sun and flowers reveal to her her own sunny and blossoming nature. She is good because she is still young, full of hope and vitality. Her situation is not good because it does her unnatural violence, because it is not the expression of her human impulses, the fulfillment of her human desires, because it is full of torment and void of pleasure. She measures her situation in life by her own individuality, her natural essence, not by the ideal of good. In this passage, Marx launched an attack on Christian ethics. Excuse me, end quote, Marx, the Holy Family. In this passage, Marx launched an attack on Christian ethics. A morality of sin, a morality of guilt, was a complete distortion of human nature. An ethic that appealed to theological abstractions, an ethic that needed the support of institution, institutional authority and superstitious threat, was an ethic of total self-alienation. To speak of goodness as divorced from species essence, to speak of goodness in terms of duality, the natural man evil, 
the spiritual man good was to impose upon man a fateful servants from his own essence. Thus divided, thus hopelessly estranged, the creative and life-producing forces of man would die. Marx's attack on Christianity was very similar to his attack on capitalism. In refuting capitalist economic theory, Marx is refuting the worldview of the capitalist ruling class. Such an attack was absolutely necessary because the worldview of the proprietary bourgeoisie was based upon the expropriation of human praxis of the laboring masses. In attacking Christianity and Christian ethics, Marx also refuted the worldview of the clergy as a class. The ethics of spiritualism sundered the human personality from its naturalistic substrate. Marx was thus engaging in broad cultural criticism. He was showing that the ideological structure of capitalism and the ideological structure of Christian ethics were merely apologies for the class interests of property owners and ecclesiastics. In the place of bourgeois and religious consciousness, Marx wished to substitute communist consciousness. The worldview that Marx wished to create, the new culture Marx wished to bring into existence, was the communist culture. The proletarian ethic would not be based on sin, would not be based on material acquisition, but rather on eudaimonism, life in accordance with the nature of the species. Georg Lukács, in History and Class Consciousness, described the superstructure of society, the ideological fabric of a society, as manifestations of class interests. Private property, free enterprise, a market economy, because they serve the class interests of the proprietary bourgeoisie, were concepts that were defended by that class. The ideas of the ruling class in society became the ruling ideas of that society. The proletariat as a class, because they were the enslaved, had different interests. Their interests favored the communalization of the means of production, the socio-political struggle of the bourgeoisie against the proletariat. Class warfare was mirrored in the struggle of Tu Velton Shang. If the pro political revolution of the proletariat was, were successful, the worldview of the proletariat would also triumph. Lukács thus saw the proletariat and its worldview as the force of negations. Bourgeoisie and proletariat representing two contradictory socio-ideological worlds. The one old and the living beyond and living beyond its time, the other new and the force of the future stood in moral mortal dialectical opposition. The proletariat must transcend bourgeois decadence. Class consciousness for Lukash was thus merely the expression of class interest. Cultural criticism, art, philosophy, and morality could thus certainly be undertaken from the point of view of class consciousness. Certainly, the dialectic of negation was crucial to Marxian cultural consciousness. Marx spent the better part of his life demonstrating how bourgeois economic theory was merely the expression of bourgeois class interest. New classes in society, new classes spawned in the womb of an old society, will always carry with them a new ideological structure, a negation of the old, but there was more. There was the naturalistic substrate of species essence. There was what there was that passionate and emotional basis of human existence, which Marx saw as the essence of social existence. This too must be incorporated into Marxian criticism. Bourgeois society was not only decadent because it perpetuated the slavery of property. Bourgeois society was decadent too because it violated the species nature of man. Thus, Marxian anthropology was another tool for judging the alienation of man in society judging whether history had indeed become true human history. That's the end of the text. I'm going to read the uh, footnotes, or the citations of Marx's critique of Hegel's dialectic and general philosophy, Marx's free human production, Marx's Grundrisse, Das Kapital, the German ideology, poverty of philosophy, the German ideology, the poverty of philosophy, Marx Grundrisse, the Holy Family, Marx the German ideology, the Holy Family, Georg Lukács, History and Class Consciousness, translated by Rodney Livingstone, Cambridge, Massachusetts, MIT Press, 1971.